You are listening to True Crime Twins, a true crime podcast hosted by Chloe and Melina Cantor. True Crime Twins is distributed by Glassbox Media and is part of the Crawlspace Media family. Welcome back to True Crime Twins, where we use our academic and occupational backgrounds in criminology and medicine to tell you crime stories. I'm Chloe. And I'm Melina. Today, we're telling you the story of Lori Erica Ruff. Lori Ruff died by suicide on Christmas Eve, December 24th, 2010, at age 42, in the driveway of her former in-laws in Longview, Texas. She had shot herself in her car. She left behind many notes. One was to her estranged husband, and one was a letter to her daughter, which had instructions to open when the daughter turned 18. Upon discovering Lori's lockbox that had strange, incoherent notes and some evidence of a false identity, they delved deeper, and Lori Ruff became a Jane Doe, an imposter who had stolen somebody's identity. It took years after her death for her to be identified through forensic genealogy. Colleen Fitzpatrick, who basically invented that field of science, personally did the investigation in identifying this Jane Doe. But first, a little background on the woman who called herself Lori Erica Kennedy. She got her associate's and then bachelor's degree in business administration in Texas. She met her husband, Blake Ruff, who was apparently from a prominent political family in East Texas, through church. Lori was a tall woman with dark hair, and she was very buttoned up and kept to herself, very secretive. And apparently this didn't bother her husband, Blake, but it did bother the Ruff family in general. If they were to ask her innocuous questions in an attempt to try to get to know their in-law better, She would become angry, argumentative, and frankly tell them that it is not their business, which is obviously a very strange way to behave, to be so cagey with people that you're trying to integrate with as family. Especially because her husband's family was prominent and probably like established in the community. They probably cared about who the son married, and they were probably immediately suspicious when she wasn't forthcoming about information from her past because it's suspicious. And I feel like that people of prominence, they like to do their homework and they like to sort of make sure that nobody has any skeletons in their closet, so to speak. And I guess their instincts were correct. Lori tried to ward off personal questions with a sad story. She said that she was from Arizona and that she came from a broken, unhappy household and that both of her parents were dead. She said that she was an only child and her father was a failed stockbroker. When Lori and Blake became engaged, the Ruff family wanted to put in an announcement in the local paper. Once they stated their intentions to do so, Lori and Blake eloped to a church in Texas and got married only before a priest with no other guests. In hindsight, this was likely because she did not want any kind of paper trail, media trace of her identity or whereabouts. Eloping, people can do that anytime they want for a variety of reasons, but I do find that it does happen when people don't want the family involved for whatever reason. Lori and Blake, after their marriage, moved to Leonard, Texas, where they intended to start a family. Apparently, Lori had fertility issues and even suffered from miscarriages. They eventually, in 2008, gave birth to a baby girl through in vitro fertilization. Because of her issues with fertility, investigators after her death believed that she was significantly older than the age she stated she was, which was 35 years old in 2008 at the time of the birth of her daughter. Once Lori Ruff was identified, and we'll get to this later, of course, it turned out she really wasn't that much older. But it's interesting, the small things that will lead investigators to speculate down a rabbit hole which end up just being red herrings. I bet the investigators that made that assumption were men (laughs) 
you can have fertility problems at any age. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're old. Yeah, it turned out that her true age was give or take a year. So that probably wouldn't have been significant. But the point is, is that she did have a daughter with her husband. She just doted on her and was very weird about other people touching her, holding her, taking care of her. Because of her cagey nature and the obsessive and almost paranoid behaviors exhibited regarding the care of her daughter, the Ruff family was concerned about a mental health issue with Lori. The marriage became strained as the conflict between Lori and the Ruff family just escalated and Blake was eventually forced to choose between his nuclear family and his wife. And he made the very difficult decision to choose his family. And he and Lori divorced in 2010. And this marked the significant unraveling and decay of Lori Ruff's mental state. It's not lost on me that when she committed suicide, that it was during a very significant holiday for most Americans, I guess. And the fact that it was in her in-laws driveway is very telling because she wanted some of them to probably discover her body and probably feel really guilty about it and maybe be like, oh, I shouldn't have treated her that way or this is what I get for being insensitive. I agree with you that the location she chose to end her life definitely was intentional and likely to send a message to the Ruff family and like you said, to invoke feelings of guilt or sympathy from them even if it was after her death. She had serious issues bordering on legal trouble during this post-divorce period. The Ruff family had filed a cease and desist from her. Apparently, she had, without permission, taken house keys from the Ruffs and had made threats. And neighbors had noticed that she and her daughter both appeared disheveled and gaunt and that Lori would ramble to herself incoherently which is all reflective of an escalation of a serious psychiatric episode. If someone is speaking incoherently and to themselves, there is the possibility that they are internally preoccupied, which is characterized by hearing voices or being occupied by some other erroneous stimuli. They may speak incoherently because of disorganized speech patterns, which is also characteristic of psychosis. The suicide note she left behind, as well as notes found in her lockbox after death, were also incoherent. And I feel like that that's showing an insight into the process of her mind and her thought process. And if even her writings were incoherent, that's going to tell you something. The roughs were desperately trying to find clues to try to answer the many unanswered questions about who this woman was. So they had access to her home, which was in complete disarray. Stacks of dishes in the sink, garbage, clutter everywhere. And like Melina talked about, these incoherent notes, some of them were actually shredded, which is significant to me in speculating on Lori's mental state at the time because these notes are incoherent. But clearly, she thinks that she's writing something so significant that it needs to be protected, it needs to be kept secret, and it needs to be shredded so nobody else could ever read them. She was clearly in a very delusional and disorganized state. But even with all of these notes and evidence of a changed identity in her lockbox, the trail went cold for years until genetic genealogy became involved. Through one of those genealogy programs like 23andMe or Ancestry, they were able to trace Lori's family to a group of Cassidy's in Pennsylvania. After some digging through distant cousins, eventually one of them recognized her and said, my God, that's Kimberly. And the investigator said that they could tell by the person's face that they literally made an identification in their head, like that something clicked. And they knew that they had found her even before they tested the DNA, which was a match. And now a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks for listening to our sponsors. Now back to the show. Colleen Fitzpatrick and her team had gotten that far because they were able to link 
this Jane Doe to the Cassidy family in Pennsylvania. And I believe they linked her to a distant cousin. And once they met the purported mother of the woman known as Lori Ruff, they were able to take her DNA and compare it to a sample taken from Lori's surviving daughter. And Lori Erica Kennedy Ruff was indeed Kimberly Maria McLean, who was born on October 16th, 1968, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The family of Kimberly had been wondering where she was for 30 years. Kimberly grew up with a sister and unfortunately had a very negative experience with her parents' divorce when she was a child. She was unable to acclimate to the new rules, new household, and new environment once her mother remarried. She eventually moved out as a teenager and then told her mother that she was going to go away forever and to not bother looking for her. The family failed to note any kind of significant stressor that would have led Lori to want to completely change her identity. Of course, we understand wanting to start over, wanting to break ties if it's an unhappy family situation, especially one that's rooted in a bitter divorce. But why steal someone's identity? Why would someone take such a drastic move? The only possibilities that really come to mind are if she was trying to escape a dangerous situation, such as one that was very abusive and it's entirely possible that her family wouldn't want to come forward and say, yes, she was being abused so horrifically that she wanted to escape and never come back. Or she was on the run hiding because she had committed some sort of criminal act. But regardless, in order to do this, she likely had to enlist the services of an identity broker, which is somebody that can create a new false identity for you, give you exact instructions on how to go about it, and make sure that the process ends with you having legitimate documents to support your new false identity. Lori traveled to Bakersfield, California, claiming that she was Becky Sue Turner, who actually had died in a house fire in Washington at two years old. How Lori became aware of Becky Sue Turner is unknown, but it's possible that this was done through an identity broker. She was able to get an ID as Becky Sue Turner, and then eventually she legally changed her name to Lori Erica Kennedy. And I can't help but wonder why she picked that name. I wonder if there is any significance there. Well, the last name Kennedy, and then she married into this very prominent family. Maybe she was fantasizing about some sort of grand life that she never had. After she legally changed her name, she was able to get a social security number under that name. So she had effectively changed her identity. My impression of Lori is that she was exceptionally intelligent. I don't know why she did what she did and ran off and started a new life. I think that a possibility that Chloe didn't mention is that perhaps she had witnessed something or somebody threatened her and it was either disappear or no longer live. I know that might sound sort of dramatic, but I really am trying to think of why she would do that. It seemed like she definitely had a psychotic break later on in life, but maybe she always was peculiar and different and needed help, but she was able to hide it because she was so smart. Like I know it takes sophistication, in my opinion, especially as young as she was to do what she did. I find these stories of Jane Doe's, John Doe's, and specifically identity thieves so interesting. There are a number of examples of people who are deceased and either went as far as to steal a dead person's identity or they just did everything possible to conceal their identity once they were dead so that no one could ever link them to their real identity. And you just think about that powerful rejection of your true self and everything that must motivate you to do so. There was a case, I believe, in Ohio that was recently resolved. A man known as Joseph Newton Chandler III was found dead in his home in 2002. This was a man who had kept to himself. And once he died and investigators tried to determine a next of kin, they realized that it was a stolen identity. Recently, they were able to identify the man as Robert Ivan Nichols through forensic genealogy. 
For a while, they knew that a family name was probably Nichols, but they weren't able to make that final identification. And it turned out that this man had a wife and son and just skipped out on them, likely to avoid paying any form of child support. Dirtbag. When I read about this particular case, I remember just having this really sick feeling that he was some kind of serious criminal, possibly of a sexually sadistic nature, especially because at a certain point under his new identity, he went to the emergency room and he had lacerations on his testicles. And he said that it was an accident with a vacuum cleaner. I feel like that that type of injury is either some sort of twisted self-harm, sadomasochistic, whatever, or maybe somebody got revenge on him. Joseph Newton Chandler III was actually an eight-year-old boy who was killed in a car accident in Texas back in 1945. It's interesting that both Lori and Robert stole the identities of these poor kids that were accidentally killed. It sort of makes me think that both of them did go through an identity broker because it sort of seems to me like it's the same strategy, but what kind of freak I don't know if they like save newspaper clippings or something as these potential leads of identities to steal. You had said to me at one point that identity thieves, I think I'd said like, oh my gosh, I'm so like obsessed with stories of identity thieves right now. And you said those are like the truest dirt bags. Do you remember saying that? I said low lives. Unless there are crazy circumstances, like I would like to think that, I guess it's better to think that Lori was escaping a bad situation instead of just abandoning her family but it's probably just that and i think it was the same thing with the other guy that the main point was to just leave everybody they're just like i'm done with you and i want this new situation now thank you so much for listening to this episode of true crime twins if you enjoy our show and look forward to new episodes please take the time to leave us a five-star rating and review on whatever platform you use to listen. You can follow us on social media, on TikTok, in Twitter, we are at True Crime Twins. On Instagram, we are at True Crime Twins Podcast. You can also email with questions, comments, case suggestions at Podcast at gmail.com.